Hello everyone. In this video, I am going to talk about the pharmacology of pregabalin. Pain is a subjective response carried through the activation of neurons and perceived by the brain. So many mediators are involved in nose deception. Some enhance the pain response and others reduce it. Excitation is produced by mediators such as glutamate, which leads to an increased neural response that may result in the induction of seizures or the enhancement of pain perception. On the other hand, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that reduces neural activity and thus reduces nociception and seizure induction. So new generation anti-epileptics act by either reducing the activity of glutamate or enhancing the action of GABA. Pregabalin acts in different ways to reduce neural conduction. It blocks the voltage-gated calcium channel, reducing the release of neurotransmitters and neural conduction. Pregabalin is well known by its brand name, Lyrica, and it is classified as an anti-epileptic drug, AED. It is structurally related to GABA, which is why we can observe the term GABA within its name. But interestingly, pregabalin does not act as GABA. Even though it is structurally related to GABA, it still doesn't bind to GABA receptors. Then how can pregabalin affect neural conduction? Pregabalin reduces the opening of calcium channels, thereby reducing impulse conduction. One of the important indications for pregabalin is the treatment of neuropathic pain. Elevated levels of glucose in diabetic patients may result in damage to neurons, leading to a loss of control and excessive firing of nociceptive neurons, resulting in neuropathic pain. Even though many of the neurons are damaged, those that supply the legs and feet are mostly affected. It may result in a few of the symptoms, such as numbness in the leg and feet, burning sensations, and pinning sensations on the feet. It may also produce muscle weakness and an excessive pain sensation. If it is untreated, it may also generate serious complications like foot ulceration. Pregabalin can reduce neuropathic pain by reducing the propagation of pain signals to the brain. Pregabalin is also indicated for the treatment of postherpetic neuralgia. Shingles caused by the varicella zoster virus produce damage to the neurons where they affect the skin region. This may result in burning pain that is sometimes sharp and jabbing. It may also result in a loss of sensation in that particular area, or it may even increase the itching sensation. Generally, neuralgia after herpes infection is more often observed in patients over 50 years old. In such conditions, pregabalin can be used to control neuronal pain. Another use of pregabalin is in the management of fibromyalgia. This is a chronic, painful condition that affects the musculoskeletal system, leading to muscle pain and tenderness. It is often associated with loss of memory, lack of sleep, and fatigue. Pregabalin can reduce the symptoms of pain while relieving fatigue and lack of sleep. Partial onset seizures affect a specific region of the brain where excessive neuronal activity can be found in a particular part of the brain. Induction of partial seizures is highly associated with excessive firing of voltage-gated calcium channels. Since pregabalin blocks the activity of these calcium channels, it can also be used as an adjuvant in the treatment of partial onset seizures. It can be used both in adults and in children, but in children younger than 4 years, it shouldn't be used. Now let's see how pregabalin alleviates neuropathic pain and reduces the induction of partial seizures. The primary conduction of neuronal impulses is carried by tiny ions like sodium and calcium. The release of many excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate is highly controlled by voltage-gated calcium channels on presynaptic neurons. The function of these calcium channels is modulated by the subunit alpha 2 delta. This subunit is a protein that tightly binds to calcium ion channels and it even promotes the expression of these channels on neurons leading to enhanced release of neurotransmitters. In conditions like neuropathic pain or with any neuronal damage, these subunits result in the excessive release of excitatory neurotransmitters by enhancing the activation of calcium channels. This results in excessive neuronal firing, resulting in either the induction of seizures or the propagation of excessive pain conduction. Now, pregabalin strongly binds to this alpha-2-delta subunit, thereby reducing its activity. 
This leads to a reduced opening of calcium channels and a decreased glutamate release. In this way, pregabalin can control pain and induce seizures. Now, let's see the pharmacokinetics of pregabalin. Pregabalin has the benefit of exhibiting fewer pharmacokinetic interactions with other medications. Pregabalin is not considerably metabolized by CYP450 enzymes because it is primarily excreted unaltered in the urine. Hence, CYP450 enzyme inhibitors or enhancers may not have a major impact on pregabalin plasma levels. Because this medicine is less protein-bound, even interactions caused by protein displacement are not seen. Food has no significant effect on the bioavailability of pregabalin, so this drug can be taken irrespective of food intake. It can be taken either with food or without food, depending on the patient's compliance and other drugs co-administered with pregabalin. In order to achieve consistent plasma therapeutic levels, it is better to take this drug every day at the same time throughout the therapy. As this drug reduces the induction of seizure potential, just like many of the antiepileptics, it shouldn't be stopped suddenly as it increases the risk of seizure induction. Hence, if the drug has to be stopped, the dose of pregabalin should be tapered slowly over a week to reduce the chance of any withdrawal complications. Pregabalin is primarily excreted through the kidneys, and its plasma levels highly depend on renal functionality. So in patients with renal failure, the dose of pregabalin should be reduced to minimize its toxic levels. Now let's see how to take this pregabalin. Pregabalin is available as capsules in different strengths. It is available in dosages ranging from 25 mg to 300 mg. Due to its wide clinical indications and dosage regimen, this pregabalin is available in different strengths. It is available in doses of 25 mg, 50 mg, 75 mg, and 100 mg. It is also available in higher doses, 150 mg, 200 mg, 225 mg, and 300 mg. The 25 mg capsules can be used, particularly in children, where the dose is fixed based on the body weight. An oral solution of pregabalin is also available at a strength of 20 mg per mil, which is again indicated in the treatment of neuropathic pain and is again indicated in children. For the treatment of neuropathic pain associated with diabetic peripheral neuropathy, the initial dose of pregabalin is started at 150 mg per day. It can be given as 75 mg capsules twice daily. It can also be taken in the form of 50 mg capsules three times a day. The dose can be further increased to 300 mg per day within one week of the treatment if no significant reduction of neuropathic pain is observed. It can be given at a total dose of 300 mg per day, which is given in divided doses of 100 mg each, three times per day. But as with the increase in dose, the adverse effects are also increased. So based on the balance between beneficial effects and adverse effects, the dose may be increased. In the treatment of postherpetic neuralgia, pregabalin should be given at an initial dose of 150 mg per day. This dose can be given in divided doses. Within one week of the treatment, based on the efficacy and tolerability of the patients, the dose can be increased up to 300 mg per day, again given in divided doses. If, even after two to four weeks of pregabalin treatment, no significant pain relief is observed, the dose can be further increased up to 600 mg per day. This dose can be given as 300 mg in the morning and 300 mg at night. Otherwise, it can also be given as 200 mg, given three times daily. Pregabalin can also be used for the treatment of partial onset seizures as adjuvant therapy. This medication can be given to both children and adults, but it is not recommended for children under the age of 4. The initial dose of this drug in children is based on body weight. As a result, for those children weighing 11 kg to 30 kg, the initial dose of this drug is given at 3.5 mg per kg per day. In children with a body weight greater than or equal to 30 kg, the dose can be given at 2.5 mg per kg, which is given in divided doses. 
The initial dose of this drug is 150 mg per day in adults aged 17 years or older. For the management of fibromyalgia, the dose of pregabalin starts at 150 mg per day. The dose can be further increased to 300 mg daily within one week of the treatment if sufficient pain reduction is not observed. Further dose increments can be done up to 450 mg per day, where pregabalin is given at 225 mg given twice daily. In patients with neuropathic pain associated with a spinal cord injury, again, pregabalin was started at 75 mg twice daily. If significant reduction of pain is not observed within one week, the dose can be increased up to 150 mg given twice daily. So the total dose for this pregabalin is 300 mg per day. If sufficient pain reduction is not observed even after two to three weeks of the treatment, further dose increments can be made to achieve the maximum dose. As a result, it can be given at a dose of 600 mg per day, with 300 mg administered twice daily. Now let's focus on the precautions of pregabalin. One important precaution with pregabalin is that it can cause angioedema, resulting in swelling of the lips, tongue, and gums. It can also produce some facial swelling. This angioedema can also cause swelling in the throat and larynx, causing difficulty breathing and respiratory compromise. The angioedema produced by pregabalin is further increased with a few drugs such as ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. A few drugs, such as enalapril and lisinopril, may increase the risk of angioedema. Because these drugs act like vasodilators, they also cause edema. Hence, when they are given along with pregabalin, they can further increase the risk of angioedema. Therefore, with such drugs, pregabalin should be carefully used. Similarly, this drug can produce hypersensitive reactions resulting in skin redness and skin rashes. It can also produce some blisters on the skin. Dyspnea, difficulty breathing, and wheezing can be observed with the use of pregabalin. But these hypersensitive reactions are not observed in all patients, and they may be observed in only a few of them. If these symptoms develop, then the use of pregabalin should be discontinued. This pregabalin should not be abruptly discontinued because it may exacerbate a few symptoms in patients, including increased insomnia, lack of sleep, increased anxiety, headache, nausea, excessive sweating, and diarrhea. All these conditions can be observed with the sudden withdrawal of pregabalin. That's why this drug should not be stopped suddenly and the dose of the drug should be tapered slowly over one week in order to reduce any withdrawal effects. Just like many of the antiepileptics, pregabalin can also increase suicidal initiation, which is more commonly observed in young and adolescent patients. Hence, caution should be taken to monitor any change in the mood and behavior of the patient with the use of pregabalin. This drug can also cause peripheral edema, which is more troublesome in patients with cardiovascular complications. This is especially important when this drug is combined with other drugs that also induce peripheral edema. A few of the anti-diabetic agents, such as glitazones, can produce peripheral edema. Since, glitazones can increase fluid retention and may impair cardiac functionality, care should be taken when pregabalin is combined with these drugs. Dizziness is one of the important side effects produced by pregabalin. This dizziness may impair daytime activities. That's why, whenever this pregabalin is taken, the patient should use caution while driving a vehicle or working with machinery. This drug can also increase somnolence or sleepiness, which again impairs their daytime activities. Weight gain is another important effect that can be observed with pregabalin. This drug can produce both edema and weight gain, which is more important in patients with any already existing cardiovascular complications. Pregabalin can also cause some blurred vision within the first few days of treatment. But with continued administration of this drug, the blurred vision can be restored. In some patients, the visual acuity may be reduced with a higher dose of this pregabalin. In such conditions, an ophthalmic examination should be done in order to check for any developments of visual disturbances in the patient. Pregabalin can also increase creatine kinase levels. 
so it can increase these levels up to 60 units per liter, which can be restored after stopping the dose. But in some patients, this drug may increase the symptoms of myopathy, resulting in muscle pain, tenderness, or weakness. In such conditions, this drug should be carefully used. Pregabalin can also produce PR interval prolongation, particularly at high doses above 300 mg per day. This drug can also reduce the platelet count, which may impair the clotting process and result in bleeding-related adverse reactions. Now let's discuss adverse effects of pregabalin. One of the most important side effects that is observed with pregabalin is dizziness. This drug can also produce somnolence, another important side effect. Other side effects mainly include dry mouth, peripheral edema, blurred vision, and weight gain. Pregabalin can impair concentration and attention in patients, resulting in abnormal thinking. Chemical form of pregabalin. This is a simple carboxylic acid, and here the adjacent carbon is alpha carbon, and the next one is beta carbon. If we extend the chain, this is gamma carbon attached to an amino group. Now this structure has four carbons with an amino group in the gamma position. Hence, it is a gamma aminobutyric acid, commonly known as GABA. Pregabalin is a structural relative of GABA, having a structure like this. An isobutyl chain is attached here. Pregabalin, while not acting on GABA receptors, is still an isobutyl derivative of GABA. Now, if we want to give the chemical name for this compound, the numbering should start with carboxylic acid. So this is 1, 2, and 3. Since a long chain is available, numbering should be continued like this. It is 4, 5, and 6. Hence, the root name will be hexanoic acid. At the third position, this group exists as a side chain. It is 3-aminomethyl. The fifth position methyl group is present, so 5-methyl. Therefore, pregabalin is a 5-aminomethyl 3-methylhexanoic acid. Great, that's the pharmacology of pregabalin. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for another interesting video with a new topic. Don't forget to hit the like button if you really enjoy this video. Have a nice day, take care, and goodbye.